In today's exciting, though admittedly rather unorthodox, patron-voted video, we'll be talking about war elephants in the age of gunpowder. Now, I'm sure that I wasn't the only child who was brought up on heroic tales of Hannibal leading his armies over the Alps and bringing with them war elephants to fight the Roman Republicans in uh, their own home territories. Uh, but of course, while the idea is heroic and incredible and exciting, the idea of Roman legions going up against mighty war elephants, it, and in Italy no less, uh, well, while the idea is terribly exciting, it was, of course, in later years that I learned that... Uh, well, most of the elephants died in the passage because, as it turns out, elephants and mountain snow doesn't necessarily, uh, they, they don't mix too well. It doesn't really work out very well for them. Um, most of the elephants died in that passage, and so there really weren't any to be used, as I understand it. It's, it's certainly not my area of expertise, but to my knowledge, there weren't really any elephants to be used in Italy uh, during the Second Punic War? Second Punic War, oh, whatever. But, um... But that's not what this video is about. This video is going to be about the 18th century and war elephants in the age of gunpowder, but where I think something very similar takes place. The idea of war elephants is really exciting. They're, you know, they're big, they're impressive, they're terrifying. It's, it's exciting because it's not something that we're used to hearing about. But then when the reality tech sets in, when the, when the reality takes place, it's, um... Well, it doesn't really live up to the expectations. Much like how Hannibal really had a great idea to bring elephants into Italy, it didn't really work out so well in practice. So, before we get into some uh, historic examples of elephants actually being used by armies during the 18th century, uh, which we'll be primarily talking about India and Southeast Asia in general, um, primarily against the British, one case against the French, as we'll see, uh, we'll, be, we'll primarily be talking about that time period. But before we get to the exact uh, scenarios in which elephants were indeed used in a militant uh, capacity during the 18th century, let's just take a brief time, a brief, brief moment, to talk about the attributes and the, um, the, the capacities, if you will, of elephants during this time period, how they might be used in war during this time period. And the first thing that you're going to notice about an elephant, big surprise here, is that they are very, very big. And what's more is they're also very, very strong. And they're imposing, they're impressive, they are a sight to behold, on, you know, at a zoo, let alone on a battlefield when you know that it's going to be coming up against you. Um, one of the biggest things that you can use an elephant for that, you know, it may have some sort of advantage over, say, a horse in would be uh, artillery pieces. Elephants, they're big, they're strong, they can probably, they can pull a great deal more, or push, as we'll see, uh, a great deal more than even cattle can. You know, a horse is one thing for pulling a gun, cattle is quite another, but an elephant? You can attach a pretty big gun onto the back of an elephant and have it drag it across, you know, any sort of terrain, rough terrain even, uh, fairly, you know, fairly well. Um, so that's one really good benefit of using an elephant, is you can haul very heavy guns with them uh, much more easily than you can, say, you know, say you have like a big siege, uh, bit, bit, uh, a siege cannon or something, you know, 24 pound cannon or something, um, you're gonna have to, you're, you're gonna have to have a lot more horses pulling that thing than if you just have an elephant that you can strap the thing to. So that's one benefit. They're really good as pack animals, presumably at least, because of how big and strong they are. What else do we have? Of course, the incredible size of an elephant also means that if you're using it as a mount, well, you can have a lot more people on the top of that elephant than just the one you can have on top of a horse. Imagine, if you will, uh, sort of like a dragoon elephant type thing. Well, on a horse, you have the rider and the gunner. It has to be the same person. That man has to be able to reload his piece and steer the horse using his legs. Uh, it's a rather difficult thing for a dragoon to be able to, you know, to train as a dragoon. Uh, uh, at least if you're a mounted dragoon and not just dis uh, mounted infantry who will ride up to an objective, dismount, fire, and then remount, and then ride away. But a dragoon, like someone who's firing their gun from on top of the horse, that's a very difficult thing to master. And of course, there's only one gunner. But if you have an elephant, a really big elephant, all of a sudden, you can have a rider who is trained specifically in, you know, guiding the elephant. Okay, you know, uh, okay, Dumbo, we're going to go over here, and then we're going to go over there, and we're going to do all these different things. And on the back of the elephant, you can have a little platform, and you could have one, two, three, you could have a great deal many gunners. You could make it basically a little mobile gunnery platform. Uh, what's more, of course, is 
not every man, well, every man up there could have a carbine as with a normal, um, as with any other, you know, sort of mounted infantry or dragoon. You could also just give them regular firearms. They don't need a carbine because all of a sudden they have a lot more room to actually maneuver around. They have a lot more space in which to operate. What's even more than that, you could put a swivel gun on top of there, you know, um, unless the noise spooks them, but we'll get to that later on. You know, a, a, a horse, if you put a swivel gun on the back of a horse, not only would it be impossible to actually maneuver and manage and everything, but the recoil on that thing, let's just say the horse isn't going to have a very good time, and neither are you if you're on top of it. But you can absolutely fit you know, a small, say, um, you know, pound or something gun on top of a... Something tells me that that could work. You could basically transform an elephant, because keep in mind as well, one musket shot, one musket shot can take down a horse, possibly at least. Uh, in fact, well, most assuredly it would. But uh, a musket shot against an elephant? You're gonna have to have quite a couple of hits against that thing in order to actually take it down. You put some sort of a box on the back of that thing, you fix a swivel gun on one side, and you could have three or even four musket men in there? You have a pretty formidable firing position, and it's portable. Basically, you take, you know, the elephant, it less serves as cavalry and more like a moving bunker of some sort, or a sort of, sort of like a gunboat, I suppose, that the Navy might use, you know, uh, in any sort of uh, river engagement or what have you. You know, if you have, um, normally, uh, the Royal Navy, you could have a bunch of men on the boat, the boat comes up and you use the swivel gun on the boat with its infantry support as sort of a mobile firing position. All of a sudden, you have an elephant, you can do that on land. That is an incredible advantage in any sort of, um, you know, closer quarters or more limited uh, area of engagement. If you can deliver that amount of strength, that amount of firepower, that amount of power to any one point on the battlefield, that could be quite an advantage. And what's more is not only can you put, of course, people on its back firing continually from a more or less secure location, if you like build a little box around that can go on the back of the elephant, but you can put armor plating on that elephant. I mean, it sounds a little bit far-fetched, but that's what they at least could do in the ancient time period, and we'll actually get to an example of them using armor plating with an elephant a bit later on. But, um, you know, put uh, a nice uh, iron plate on the, on the thing's um, snout or you know, on its face, the front of it, whatever you want to call that, the front of the elephant, you put some armor plating on the side, all of a sudden, you know, you're arming this thing more like the cuirassier, uh, you know, the, 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 the soldier on top of the heavy cavalry in the Napoleonic period. Keep in mind, that armor that the cuirassiers wore, wore could indeed deflect at least weaker, um, you know, small arms fire. A heavy thing that you can put onto an elephant, all of a sudden that thing is deflecting musket shots. You would have to turn artillery against that uh, against that uh, elephant in order to actually take it down. That is a very powerful mobile firing position. But not only that, imagine you're going up against a line of war elephants, even just the one, and you happen to not have any artillery with you. Now. If there's infantry going up against cavalry, a cavalry advance, be they dragoons, be they heavy cavalry, lancers, whatever it's going to be, well, the usual response, as I'm sure we are all aware, would be to form square. You take your line of infantry, you have them, you know, sort of double back onto one another, and you form a square of men. The idea, of course, being that the front rank can kneel and put the bayonets in front of them, the men in the back can have the, um, you know, can, you know, be at the ready with the bayonets, uh, you know, at their waist, pointing outwards, and you have a sort of, um, you know, angle design with bayonets forward and up. It looks like a fence, more or less, and it is just, it's just a line of steel, of bayonets, of men with, uh, with melee weapons, with pikes, with spears, basically, and it goes all the way around. A horse will not charge that, and indeed, uh, the horse, the, the, uh, the cavalry rider, the, the horseman, that's the word I'm looking for, he's not going to charge it either, because if a horse goes against that row of bayonets, not only is it likely to stop and rear up because, um, you know, it's, it's a horse, sure, but it's probably smart enough to not run itself into a line of bayonets, um, so odds are it's just going to stop and then go the other way, that's the first advantage of being in a square against cavalry. But say you have a whole bunch of cavalrymen and a bunch of really stupid horses or a bunch of very, very courageous, brave uh, cavalrymen, and they are going to run straight through that line. Well, all of a sudden, hold on now, two, line, two bayonets, a horse runs into the bayonet, up, 
Suffice to say, without getting too gruesome, the horse will not make it. The horse, you know, runs into the square. It pretty much immediately dies. The rider is thrown off. So if he's not dead, he's probably going to be killed first, fairly soon, or at the very least disarmed and taken as a prisoner. Probably just killed. It is a battlefield after all. Uh, so the horse is dead. The man, the, the man on the back is incapacitated or dead himself. Even if there is a break in the line, say, for example, the horse has such a uh, forward momentum that indeed it crashes into the men and it sort of like goes over top of them or they're thrown back, any number of things. Um, at the absolute worst case scenario, the, the line immediately reforms and or even, you know, wasn't disformed to begin with, but they're able to actually hold fast and the horse stays there. Um, if the horse does manage to get through, you have a break in the line. Congratulations. And how thick is that break in the line? Two men, four men, maybe. It's, it's a very tiny breach. And that's the effectiveness of the square, is that you can break it with cavalry, sure, but you're going to have to have a lot of cavalry. And of course, by the time you break through one end, all of a sudden, oh, we're surrounded with infantry. That's why a square is so useful against cavalry. It's a, it, it basically has multiple layers of defense, where even if they breach one uh, side of the thing, just a couple of men can just turn around and all of a sudden, oh, hey, look at that. You have a wonderful, clean shot at the cavalrymen. Um, so it's very difficult for cavalry to break through. But all of a sudden, you have an elephant, a war elephant, a big, armored beast with tusks and men with guns, you know, with you know, possibly even with grape shot or whatever on its back. Again, that's if we can put a swivel gun on the back of the thing, which might be a little bit much. It might be a little bit fantastical, I admit. But, you know, roll with it for now. The elephant runs up to the line, and if you can convince it to do this, this would be the trick, but we'll get to that later, like I said. The trick would be, of course, convincing the elephant to actually go through the line, but if it does, an elephant's going to be able to, let's say, worst case scenario, the elephant runs up to the line, and with all the bayonets and shot and everything, the elephant is killed. The elephant plows through, falls over, all of a sudden you don't have a little break in the line which is all of a sudden very rapidly surmounted as men like pull the horse away and then reform the line or whatever. No, you have a multi-ton beast laying in the middle of where the line was. That line is shattered. Th to say nothing, of course, if the elephant runs through, doesn't immediately die because it's an elephant, odds are it's not going to. A couple of turns of its head, some, you know, bashing of its legs or whatever, that it could throw an entire line into confusion. It, it can make it lose its cohesion very rapidly in a way that I'm sure you can all see. I, you know, I'll be honest, right now I'm sort of envisioning scenes from uh, Lord of the Rings, the third episode, when the Oldifants, you know, the really big war elephants, uh, come in and they're just swiping away at the cavalrymen. Um, you know, it, it, it's, a great, it's a great scene, but um, that's the sort of thing that you could expect to happen. I mean, whether or not it succeeds ultimately in breaking the square, the line, or, or I'm sorry, no, the gap in the line that that elephant is going to form with its life is going to be a lot bigger. Two, three, four, five elephants? All of a sudden, that square is not exactly looking so solid. Uh, the only way that you can really stand against that sort of thing would be to have a very thick formation. And throughout large portions of the 18th century, especially in the later periods of the 18th century and into the Napoleonic, especially British doctrine called for very thin lines. If you have a line of two, with two men thick, three men thick, and all of a sudden there's an elephant charging at it, it can break through that thing pretty easily. And of course, this is all ignoring the primary reason why elephants were always used in warfare, and the big reason why people throughout history, whether or not it has ever worked using war elephants, it's the reason why we always really, really wanted war elephants to work. That's because it looks cool. Which, okay, I, that's a rather, um, you know, that's a rather silly way to put it, I admit. But war elephants, they, like, well, like we said, they're big, they're imposing, they're threatening. They have spikes coming out of their face for crying out loud. The ears are huge. They're terrifying. Not so much with Indian elephants, you know, they have tinier ears and everything. And that's actually how uh, most of the elephants that we're going to be talking about were Indian elephants because it's taking place in India, not in Africa. The North Africans weren't using war elephants by this time period uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but even still, even with, even with the tinier ears, they're still threatening. Even with the tinier Indian elephants over top of the, uh, the African elephant, they're still terrifying. 
That's the thing. They are a weapon of morale, especially if you've never seen one before, which makes sense if you're, be you, you know, a Roman peasant turned legionnaire, after, well, that'd be after the Marian reforms, but be you some Roman guy, you know, off fighting in North Africa against the, um, the Carthaginians, or be you, you know, some farmer from Dorset who happened to be shipped over to India, you, you know, you want for, uh, for a bit of bad luck there. The first time you're going to see an elephant, be it, you know, on the battlefield or not, it's, you know, you haven't grown up with the idea of, oh yeah, you go to the zoo, you see an elephant, that's the end of it. Elephants are mysterious. They're otherworldly creatures. They're from another world, you know, another continent, but a whole other reality than the one that you've ever known before. And that's, you know, that's even without the fact that you're going to have to fight them. It's, uh, if you are standing in a line in India, for example, and you see either for the first time or maybe for the third time in your life, I admit maybe it's the third or fourth time, you see a line of elephants and they're running at you and you know, okay, well, um, my gun, it can drop a man oh, we, and it can drop a horse, but that thing, I'm not even confident that it's going to be able to break that thing's skull. That can be absolutely terrifying. They are an, an incredible morale-based weapon. But of course, there are a number of problems with war elephants because, um, well, we all know how the whole British and India thing ended. Uh, didn't exactly end very well for the Indians. And, um, well, there was a reason why war elephants aren't exactly a popular topic with the 18th century. So, what are the downsides of using elephants in warfare during this time period? Well, for starters, even if elephants were very effective on the field of battle, which we will see they are not, um, even if they were very effective tools, they probably would never have taken off in Europe anyways. For starters, think of the importation costs for European armies to utilize war elephants. Not only are they unused to these creatures, that they wouldn't necessarily know how to, you know, how to handle them, but um, it'd be very, very expensive to actually transport them over to Europe. Not only would it be very expensive to move them over to Europe, but to house them would be very expensive. To feed them, very expensive. To maintain an elephant on the march in any environment, be it the Alps or be it, you know, northern France, would be an incredibly difficult thing for a European army to, for any army, let alone a European one, which has no experience with these beasts, unlike with horses, which it has a great deal of experience of, you know, past hundreds and hundreds of years, um, it'd be very, very difficult for them to maintain these beasts. Even in the days, you know, in the ancient period when war elephants were used, they're usually in very small numbers. You know, for every one elephant, for every one war elephant that you can bring to the field on its own, without any sort of accoutrements or armor or anything like that, just the elephant, for every one you have, the enemy can have 10, 50, 100, however many horses, cavalrymen. And what's more than just that is not only are the elephants going to be terribly outnumbered, and numbers matter a great deal on the field of battle, because of course, you know, you're not dealing with a little engagement of 50 guys versus 50 guys, as with video games and whatnot. No, you're dealing with thousands of men along multi-mile fronts. You're going to have, you know, movement and numbers matter a great deal there because even if you manage to push the enemy back in one location, say because you have a really powerful core of armored elephants like we were talking about, you push them back in one place, but then, oh, and then the cavalry swept around us and they just bypass the army and now they're, you know, they're laying siege to our cities and they're burning our crops and they're just wrecking havoc back home and we have to now try and turn around and go back to that. It's difficult. It's very difficult to, to beat an army when they can outmaneuver you so very readily. So not only are horses much cheaper, but they're much faster as well. You are able to take, you know, a massive number of horses you're, you're still able to have them be quite powerful, you know, dragoons, heavy cavalry, things like that. And you can get them on a battlefield where you need them, when you need them, very, very quickly, very efficiently. Whereas the elephants, it's a lot more difficult to actually use them to their full advantage on the field of battle because of how slow they are and how limited in number they are. And that's, of course, to say nothing at all about the costs of armoring the thing, which you don't have to do, of course, but if you were to go along with, you know, the idea that I proposed earlier of the heavily armored war elephants with gunners on the back and use it as a sort of, like, mobile pillbox in a very rudimentary fashion, a very early age, um, 
think that would be incredibly expensive. Think of the cost, not only of, you know, uh, uh, training all the men to fight efficiently on top of an elephant, which it's difficult enough to fight men to fight efficiently on top of a horse, let alone on top of an elephant like that. Um, you'd have to build the actual, like, box to put on top of it, but the iron plating around it, the along the sides and along the front, that would be incredibly expensive and very difficult to produce. You know, massive hunks of iron like that are not exactly easy things to make, and uh, that would require a great deal of armor-based infrastructure, which by the 18th century doesn't really exist for the most part. You know, the French maintain something of a tradition of producing armor for their soldiers because, uh, especially in the Napoleonic era, you know, they did have armored cavalry of a sort, and as we said, that was, that was actually quite efficient for them, but um, it's very, very expensive to maintain. For an elephant? Much more so. So not only can you have more horses on the field, and you can get them where they need to go faster, but uh, when it comes to a horse versus an elephant, well, a horse is much easier to direct, to control. I mentioned earlier that it was something of a, maybe of a bad thing, that uh, a cavalryman, you know, it's one man to both control the horse and to operate whatever, you know, weapon he's using, be it a carbine or a uh, lance or a saber or whatever it is. But I think that's also one of the best advantages of cavalry versus, you know, elephants in the field of battle, is that one man directing the horse, he oftentimes will have a very good relationship, as strange as that may be to say, as strange as it may sound, uh, but it's the sort of thing that a cavalryman absolutely would say. They can have a very close relationship with their animal. Oftentimes, cavalrymen, you know, would be purchasing and supplying their own mounts. That only really ended, you know, towards like the First World War, uh, you know, the very late Victorian, early Edwardian type time period. Before that, every man, you know, his mount is his own horse, um, his own beast. Um, but uh, what's more is, an individual man controlling the mount, he's able to have a great deal more control over where the animal goes, how it behaves, because a horse isn't quite so testy, if you will, as an elephant, or at least it's not always the case. Um, you, you know, if you want to order your horse to go through a, you know, a gap in an enemy line, through hellish fire and smoke and the terrors of war, you can train a horse very well to do that sort of thing. A horse be they very smart or very dumb, you know, I've heard both explanations for this sort of thing, but a horse can be trained very, very well. And, I mean, look at things like, um, you know, the Charge of the Light Brigade, going through the Valley of Death. A horse will do that, and so long as the rider is confident enough and knows how to, you know, manage the animal, a horse can do something like that. But an elephant? Well, elephants get scared, and that is the biggest thing, I think, a lot more so than even the costs involved, more than anything else, elephants get scared. They are terrified of, well, you know, terrifying things, I suppose. Um, and more often than not, at least in the 18th century, in all the examples that I found, when it comes to an elephant going against modern day armies with, you know, musketry, with cannon shot, and with rockets especially, well, they don't, they turn, they run, they don't do very well. And oftentimes, more often than not, at least, again, with the examples that I've found, the elephants ended up killing more of their own men than ever uh, having done any sort of harm to the enemy lines. Now, that was also, of course, the case in the ancient time period, uh, you know, and there, there are those amusing little uh, stories and anecdotes by ancient uh, historians about people setting pigs on fire and using them to scare elephants, which um, is, I, I think, rather dubious at best, but, um, well, it was enough for Rome total war, I suppose. But that's the thing is, yes, elephants, it's one of the few things that total war got right. Elephants run amok, and when they do, it's not exactly a very good thing. At the, you know, at the absolute best, you probably have to kill the thing in the field, assuming that you have the capacity to do so. If not, well, all of a sudden you're fighting your own elephants. It's not exactly a good situation to be in. And what's more, despite all of those reasons as to why elephants are not very good on the field of battle, of course, it isn't a European tradition. You know, elephants aren't native to Europe. Big surprise for everyone, but they don't really belong there. I mean, despite the fact, it, indeed it is despite the fact, that elephants aren't terribly useful in war, like I said, the idea persists. People really want war elephants to work more than they ever really did. And in the East, 
That sort of tradition is very, very strong. War elephants have been used in the Eastern world, in India and in Burma and those regions. Um, they were used in a military capacity. And so why would they continue using them in the 18th century when they consistently showed that they were not exactly the most useful things, primarily because they had always been used before? It was because of this, the tradition of actually using elephants in the field of battle, they represent the, the fact that they represent something on the field, that they represent the sort of power and majesty of various, you know, noble princes and such in these regions. It's a very Mughal, or Mughal sort of uh, symbol of the elephant, especially on the battlefield, you know, the emperors and such, the Mughal emperors in, in India, the um, Islamic uh, um, you know, government which basically ruled over uh, at least, you know, most of India for a very long time. Um, you know, that's a big symbol of their authority is the elephant. And so, despite the fact that, again, they were consistently shown as not really working, and the fact that really the only thing an elephant does, if you're a nobleman and you're riding on your elephant in the field of battle, the only thing it really does is point out to everyone else, you know, on the other side of the field, oh, look, that's where their general is. How can I tell? Oh, because he's the one on the giant beast of war with all of, like the fancy carpeting and the rugs and all the musicians following him around. It's a very Eastern style of um, kingship and ruler uh, that the that the ruler is something of a uh, something of you know transcendent uh, as opposed to his you know com to the common people. Um, that that he is elevated literally on the back of a mythical beast. Uh, even for the locals, um, you know, there's certain, there's absolutely a, a power dynamic of sorts going on there, but all it really does is it makes you slower maneuvering on the battlefield than if you had been, you know, on a horse, and it makes you a much bigger target. But despite that, it was still used in the East because of what it represented. People wanted elephants to work in the battlefield a lot more than they ever did. People uh, you know, respected the symbol of authority that the elephant represented, both, you know, literally and figuratively, again, elevating the leader up above all of the common soldiers. So, as unexciting as it may seem, that's really the big reason why elephants were never used in warfare in the 18th century, aside from, uh, you know, in Southeast Asia and in India, because really, not much about them is really all that efficient. And, I think that that really comes out, it really shines through when we look at some genuine historical examples of when war elephants were used against those modern European armies of a new style, or at least of a new style in India, where, you know, of course, the natives hadn't really run up against any sort of foe of such discipline and strength before. So the first few battles that I'd like to talk about today are from the Carnatic Wars, which um, I won't go into too much detail about. Suffice to say, the Carnatic Wars uh, are what solidified British East India Company rule in India. They really, um, you know, saw the French sort of forced to leave the area, at least as any sort of major or significant power, and um, place the British at the forefront of Indian politics. Um, of course, India at this time is not a united country. It's all divided amongst various uh, princelings. Uh, there is an emperor, the Mughal emperor, but he's declining in strength more and more every day, less and less relevant as local rulers and local princes take more and more authority among themselves. Uh, oftentimes in these you know, uh, we're talking like the 1750s or thereabouts around this time period, like mid, early to mid 18th century. Um, uh, oftentimes, these various princes and leaders of cities and minor states and everything would look for any advantage they could get in, uh, you know, exerting their control and winning more lands and such for themselves in India. Uh, they would they would oftentimes look to European forces. So the uh, British East India Company, as well as the French Company, and a lot of foreign mercenaries really, um, you know, were able to get involved in the thick of things in the politics there. Um, they oftentimes were allied to various native princes and kings and everything in their their own power struggles, and it was using these, uh, you know, very tactful alliances that the uh, British East India Company ultimately, which of course, you know, they would be the ones to win out in the end, uh, they won things like tax rights for themselves and uh, the right to trade in various regions, thing, things like that. So it's in one of those wars, uh, again, the Carnatic Wars would be the um, the, the overarching uh, term for all these uh, engagements. Yes, it's in one of these wars that we have the Battle of Plassey, with, uh, Clive of India, you know, the man who conquered India for the British. Uh, how it usually goes. Uh, it's one of the most important battles 
I'd say in British imperial history and indeed in Indian history as well. Um, suffice to say for now, again, we have the uh, British and native allies whom they're working with going up against, um, you know, some French uh, soldiers as well and a very, very large, indeed overwhelming numbers of uh, foreign uh, foreign military. There's a lot of politics, half the enemy army defected and whatnot, but, uh, you know, a lot of gunnery back and forth. They never really met, the point, the point is this, Battle Plassey, they never really met in one big massive engagement. You know, looking at the numbers, it may seem like a sort of like Rourke's drift of, uh, you know, a small cadre of uh, British and other European soldiers holding out against hordes of Indian men. Uh, not really. The, the entire battle wasn't really that exciting, I'm afraid. But, this was the first example that I was able to find of elephants being used, again in a military capacity, against the British in India. And they were actually used to help haul these massive gun platforms. So the gun platforms weren't on the elephants, but uh, you know, big like wooden platforms with wheels that, on which there were very big guns, you know, batteries of cannon, which were literally being dragged up to into position to you know fire against the British. These big gun batteries were being pulled by you know a whole bunch of bullocks, and they were actually pushed from the back by elephants who were you know being prodded along and everything with their heads, able to push these massive wooden platforms along to sort of, you know, slowly, but I suppose fairly efficient, efficiently, move the entire gun battery without it having to even, like, redeploy. So, you know, you don't have to limber up the guns and then have them redeploy. It's just the gun is already there. You're able to fire, and the platform is able to move against the enemy. It seems like a pretty good idea, but... Again, for a number of reasons, primarily actually being uh, the fact that the Indian gunners who had to man them, and some uh, French gunners as well, as I recall, you know, it, they couldn't really match the, uh, you know, the, the British uh, East India Company's own artillery skill and um, you know, a number of things happened. It didn't really work out too well for them. But that's an example of elephants being used in, uh, in a battlefield setting. Not terribly exciting, I'm afraid, but we get more exciting. Next, we have the Siege of Arco, and this one's a lot more exciting, like I said. In this one, we actually have the British defending a small uh, a town or a city or something like that. Uh, again, Clive of India actually is commanding these forces, and at one point in the battle, he personally commanded one of the artillery batteries. Um, rather interesting stuff. It's an interesting history if you want to read up more about the Carnatic Wars. But um, for the purposes of war elephants, the British, of course, have walls because they're in a town or a fortified town, and they have very heavy gates. Indian army, well, of course, there were Indians inside fighting with the British as well. It wasn't a, it wasn't a simple matter of, of like, Europeans versus Indians. It, it wasn't so straightforward. There were always Indians on both sides, and indeed, they oftentimes, in fact, pretty much always, represented the majority of the forces. The East Indian Company was allying itself with Indians more than the other way around. But um, the enemy Indian army outside the walls has to, of course, find a way to break through that gate. And so what they actually did was they took a whole bunch of elephants, they put massive iron plates on their foreheads, and with men behind them, with, you know, like, long wooden sticks, prodding them along, they were going to use the elephants as literal living battery rams to walk up to the gate and ram the gates down, uh, at which point, of course, the Indian infantry could stream through and overwhelm the uh, British defenders. But here's the thing. The elephants, you know, they're being prodded along by a couple of men, you know, a couple of men behind them with long wooden sticks prodding them along at the behind, you know, to give them, you know, a little spur to move onwards. Well, there's one thing, you know, that's a nuisance, that's a pest going on behind you. The elephants are plodding along, you know, they're probably annoyed and everything. And all of a sudden, what's that noise? I'm beginning to hear some cracking noises the elephant must be thinking to himself. He looks up and he sees some smoke up ahead. And then all of a sudden, a million little bee stings begin peppering him all over the plate. Musketry. Musketry. Cannon shot. Modern day, you know, firearms and such. The elephants go up against these modern armies and um, rather than decide to go up against all of that, you know, they get spooked. The elephants turn around and they decide, you know what? I like my chances fighting you, little man with a stick, a lot more than I do fighting the wall that's exploding fire at me. And so they charge the other way, and they end up killing, like I suggested that they would earlier, a great deal more of their own men than they ever did have, you know, a positive effect on the battlefield. Um, so that's another excellent example of elephants being used in the age of gunpowder in a military capacity. Oh dear. Well, here's hoping that the next example will prove more um, fruitful, more exciting for us, right? 
right? Well, not quite, because this time we have the Battle of Amber, and this time it's actually uh, Indian elephants, war elephants, going up against the French army, and there's a great deal, of, well at least there's one very exciting um, uh, picture that I was able to find depicting this battle, like, oh man, this is what I'm really looking for, look at that, there's an elephant, there's infantrymen in the back, and there's people with guns on the back of the elephant fighting, this is exactly what we're really looking for when it comes to war elephants in the age of gunpowder. This is the closest that I could find to any actual account of the battle. The only thing that I can find about this battle, the Battle of Amber, is that apparently there were over a hundred war elephants used, and the French won. That's it. Now, I, 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 I mean, start on Wikipedia, of course, but then, okay, well, you go to the, Wiki the sources that Wikipedia links. Nothing that I could find there. I, I do searching all over the internet, Google, Scholar, everywhere. I couldn't find any details about this actual battle. The only thing that I can determine is that there were a lot of soldiers, one, of, one side had over a hundred war elephants, and they didn't do a thing in the actual battle. Their leader ended up dying, probably, I think that's what this is portraying, the uh, leader of the, um, you know, the French's enemy's army, uh, he, you know, him dying while presumably on his elephant because it just made him a really big target. That's it. So, a hundred war elephants, and I can't find, there's no exciting stories, there's no exciting anecdotes, there's no, you know, terrified accounts of French soldiers, you know, with their bayonets looking, you know, up at this massive war beast, no, nothing like that. Not, so, yeah, not terribly exciting there either. And that, that just about does it for the Carnatic Wars, for the examples that I could find of elephants being used in battle. Maybe if we just go a little bit more into the future, maybe if we can skip ahead to the Anglo-Burmese War, the 1830, 1820s, 1830s, I think. Maybe if we skip ahead there, we can actually find a proper, exciting case of elephants being used. Don't count on it. So again, now we come to the first Anglo-Burmese War, and the siege, or the Battle of Banubiu, ba ba Banubiu, uh, the, the name is here, I, I, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it properly. Uh, this engagement, in which the British are laying siege to a town called that, or it would be, over, it would be here, yeah, called this, you know, the Battle of the town. Um, the British are attacking this town in, again, in Burma, or in modern-day Myanmar, is what it would be called. So the British launch an assault against this town, and, uh, well, their assault is beaten back. You know, they, they move in pr presumably with infantry and with uh, cannon support and everything, the way that assault or ever takes place in this time period, and they are beaten back. The uh, local leader, I I'm afraid I don't know his name or his title, but it would be a local Burmese leader, um, decides to actually countercharge the British lines in an attempt to break through uh, and so he charges with infantry, cavalry, and with war elephants to move against the British line. But here's the thing. The British have a little new invention called Congreve rockets. They use them in the Napoleonic Wars to some effect, but um, elephants, as it turns out, don't do terribly well against screaming balls of fire hurtling at them from the sky. Again, we have a case that when the, again, this massive, in, massive uh, Indian Burmese army Countercharges British lines, they fire off their Congreve rockets, the elephants get spooked, and they run away. They have no meaningful effect on the actual battle. And something tells me they probably killed a great deal of their own men in that retreat as well, just as, you know, is oftentimes the case with this sort of thing. So, some conclusions. War elephants in the age of gunpowder. The idea, the topic, is really exciting because we can imagine these massive armored beasts with cannon on their back and everything move, just, you know, moving straight through British squares and de devastating effects on uh, European armies and everything, showing the triumph of like an older style of living over top of those, you know, modern uh, something or other. You know, it's a great movie idea, it's a great story, but oftentimes the reality doesn't really live up to it. War elephants, while they may be terrifying and big, well, they get scared very easily, and oftentimes that leads to them killing more of their own men than of the enemy. They're very expensive. They're difficult to maintain. Odds are, if you happen to get one of them, the enemy has so many more cavalrymen, they can just go around you, let alone, of course, if they just do enough pinpricks against the elephant to actually kill it off. So while the idea of war elephants can be really exciting on the battlefield, well, more often than not, they just don't live up to the height. They're certainly not worth their weight in salt. 
let alone a horse's weight in salt, which is a lot cheaper, let's be honest. But either way, until the next time, my dear viewers, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.